Welcome to Research Made Easy. My name is Professor Richard Watson, and I'll be taking you through our session today. Um, we are welcome to my page, and I think one of the things that you have been listening to as of now is how to do research. And I've looked into how to do qualitative research. I've explained how we start the process of research, how to select a topic, be able to and identify a research gap and build a research problem and then go through literature review, data, um, developing a framework that's a conceptual framework and then moving from a conceptual framework to the data collection and then or defining the appropriate research design, the data collection. Now we are talking about analysis. Now I've talked about analysis before, but this is I'm trying to put it together in a different way. I know many students find it very difficult to be able to start qualitative data analysis. And there are several discussions in several books about the process. In this new series, what I want to try and do is to try to explain the step-by-step -step process that may, um, or step-by-step -step guide that may enable or support a student or a researcher to be able to carry out qualitative data analysis. So this is the first part, and I'll take my time to give the fundamentals of the qualitative data analysis so that you have an overview of what it entails, especially from the perspective or the paradigm that I come from. And I'll talk about that later. Now, to start off, I'll also be drawing on some um, doctoral works that I have supervised to be able to show examples from students' doctoral thesis so that you can be able to see that some of the things I'm teaching are quite relevant to what you will be carrying out within a doctoral thesis. Now, I'm using a doctoral thesis because when I use a, a published paper or a, um, an, a, a general article, you don't usually see what goes behind the ana analysis process. All you see is maybe some few themes have been developed and then there's discussion and then it's conclusion. But I want to go behind the scenes of what happens during the process of analysis so that every student can be able to understand and follow, follow, follow step, a step-by-step -step guide in achieving that. So let's start off. Now the first key principles that I want to establish before we are going to explain qualitative data analysis is that there are several approaches to qualitative, qualitative data analysis. And I'll come up to that later. There are several approaches and they can tell the approaches are specific to a paradigm. Like if somebody comes from a philosophical paradigm like interpretive or like critical realism, there may be certain types of qualitative data analysis that you may be more open to. The approaches also differ by authors. Sometimes certain authors are able to make uh, uh, prescribe certain uh, steps that you should follow and those techniques of steps that you follow then become named after the author so you have got mouse and human mouse qualitative data techniques and then, then you have got Creswell's discussions on qualitative data techniques and then there are quite a number of points take quite a number of different authors within their books propose ways to carry out qualitative data analysis. Okay, now these approaches rely on a number of proven techniques which are uh, uh, scientifically proven. In respect of the different techniques that may exist uh, or approaches that may exist, there are techniques within them that, so there's an approach and there's a technique. The approach is what sometimes the person, the thing is named after, the person, uh, the qualitative data analysis approach is named after. Within that, there are some techniques that you apply. And the techniques that you apply sometimes are common to all and they have been tested and been established. As researchers use these techniques, they tend to personalize or develop their own approach. That's why their approaches get uh, born. Hence, in my presentation, I'm going to try to teach a number of approaches I use for the different types of research works I have engaged in. But each of these appro approaches draw on proven techniques which are verifiable. So you realize that some of the things I'll be talking about are drawing on a multiplicity of techniques coming from different authors. And even after taking you through this process, you realize that when you go and pick somebody's paper to read, you start seeing certain techniques that they have applied, even though he's calling the approach a particular name. 
So the first thing I would like to say is that every qualitative data analysis should begin from the premise of the research study. Now the premise of the research study define the purpose in the, and the premise of the study. So it gives us direction. It tells us the intent of the research. The, it answers the questions. It tries to answer the questions why we are here and where we are going. So that the author or the, the person who's been carrying out the analysis process know, knows what is the potential outcome of what, of what he's looking for or what could shape the potential outcome of what he's looking for. The premise of the study is going to inform the research design and the decisions made during the process of the analysis. And it's the eye of the analysis. Without the eye, the researcher cannot see the value buried in the data. The research study and the researcher are blind without the eye. And that's why we are here. So when you are starting any qualitative data analysis, the first question that you have to answer is why are we here? Why are we here? Uh, the, con the question that defines the constituents of the premise of the study. That means that what is the research purpose? What questions and objectives are we are trying to address? What framework is informing the process of addressing the research questions and objectives? What problem emanated from the literature that defined the research questions and objectives? What title, what title of, of, of what's the title of the piece of work we are doing? Because sometimes by the time you analysis and the outcome of the study can even come back, you may have to go back and shape the title of your of your of your research work. Not all research, qualitative research has a research framework. It depends on the type of study. So that's why I have an asterisk on the research framework. But what am I trying to say here? When you are doing out an analysis of data, it means that you have collected the data already. And that data that you have collected, you collected it for a purpose. And that purpose was defined by your research problem or informed by your research problem that led to certain purpose, objectives, and questions. And those, of course, you wanted to address that you also defined the research framework that told you that the variables and the relationships you'll be exploring within the particular study. So if you don't know the research framework, if you don't know what research questions you have in mind, when the data is presented before you, what value are you going to look for? Because the analysis process is a process of engaging with data to be able to derive value from it. So that that value that you gain from the data can inform the research study or address the research questions and objectives. And also have connections to the literature so that we can know what is new and what is being confirmed. Listen carefully. The analysis process is has an objective of engaging with data to derive value from it and the value that we derive from it has to have connections with the literature that we have discussed in whether it's a phd chapter two or a thesis chapter two or chapter wherever your literature review was and then what you what you wrote in your research framework so when you gain the value we have to make connections with the literature to see whether there's value in it but there is some, the value that you have obtained is new or it is being confirmed. And even what defines that it is valuable is shaped by the relationships and variables that you sought to understand or to explore or to explain or to describe within your research process. The premise of the study is the eye that is needed before you can talk about data analysis and discussion. Now, when you say the purpose of the study, you are defining that after I've read, done my research problem, and I may have identified about four or five different problems, this is the ones I want to address. That, that informs the research purpose. When you define that research purpose, and you use that one to develop research objectives and research questions, when you go into the analysis, your eye has to be on the purpose. As an op as the lens through which you are looking into the data, because the data can be voluminous. But what makes something of value is how that thing is connected to the questions that you are seeking or the objectives that you have. And how that thing even is connected to the topic area that you are researching on. Or how that particular piece of information you have found that you may call valuable connects to some of the problems that you, re you research on. It is very really likely that even though you came out with three objectives, as you are looking into the data, 
you may find something in the data that answers one of the research one of the research gaps you found but that research gap was not captured in your research purpose that's why i arranged it this particular way so you're one of the first lens the first le- in terms of the lens the apex of the lens the tip of the lens the first thing you should you should use to look into the, the data should be a purpose and then from the purpose you look at your ob- questions and objectives then you can come to research framework uh, the research problem the research title the research topic in, in, in area now i like to use that process this process but you can use a combination of them because i'm not trying to say that one is more important than the other but by the time you finish you have exhausted your data using these six dimensions of these constraints or the premise of the study so that when you see i've analyzed the data the data itself has been engaged by these six dimensions have we found something new that's relevant to or confirmed that can connect with the purpose have we found something that can connect with the questions have we found something that can connect with the search framework have we found something that can connect to other gaps in the research problem that we didn't put in our purpose have we found something that can even resonate our title or inform the research title that we have have we found something that informed the general topic area let me give an example so i'm going to draw I'm going to draw on a thesis of one of my PhD students that I supervise. He's called Dr. Jesse Budo. He was doing a study. This doctor thesis won the best, the Vice Chancellor's Best Award, uh, award for best thesis in the humanities at the University of Ghana in 2020. Now, Dr. Joseph did data platforms and value creation evidence from the Department of I supervised him. I want to show you something about his work. So let's go into, so he has a research purpose, research objectives. I just want to jump into his um, his research questions, which research objectives. Okay, let's start from the purpose, because I mentioned the purpose. So when you look at the purpose of Dr. Joseph's work, he said that to address the gaps enumerated from the research program I mentioned that, this study draws on the theory of our founders. So he's telling you that like, even his purpose is being informed by the gaps and then a theory. So his purpose is not just coming from any, it's, it is being informed by this. So at least you now I understand why I was saying the purpose is what I tend to look, use to guide my steps of looking to data. So the purpose starts from here. It draws on the theory of finances to explain contextual conditions, the concrete outcomes of digital forms and platform that's value and the digital platform affordances and constraints. The aggregate explanation vis a vis the research program culminates into a research program that explains how digital platforms afford or constrain value in the music industry. Hence, my research purpose, that Jesus Bush's purpose, is to develop a framework that explains how digital platforms afford and constrain value in the Ghana's music industry. The, the, so by the time he finishes the study, a framework has to be developed. That is one thing you should establish. Number two, that framework should, should, do, should be explanatory, not descriptive, not exploratory, explanatory. Number three, that particular framework should be able to engage with digital platform, the topic area, and then the context, music industry, and be able to tell us how digital platforms can help us afford or constrain value. So when we look into Joseph's work and we look at the culminating framework, we should look for value. We should look for digital platforms. We should look for things that cause affordance and things that cause constraining. And then we should be able to, and we should be, it should be embedded in the music industry. When I go back to the premise of my, on my study so i mentioned that the research purpose is now defining that when i do my analysis i should be able to engage the context that's my industry in the music industry in terms of jesus home i should be able to find in terms of my framework find variables or um, um, factors that afford factor that constrain value i should be able to find a form of value what is value 
I should be able to tie, look at what type of value is being created in the music industry. I should be able to find these things in an explanatory manner. Means that there should be a mechanism that tells you how these things come together. It means my analysis is not just looking for factors. My analysis should look for value, should look for factors of affordance, should look for factors of constraining, should be able to be relevant to the music industry. My analysis should end up telling me a mechanism that makes these things work together. See, that's why I start from the purpose. So I can't just get up and say I'm doing analysis. I really need to get these things right. The research purpose should be clear in my mind. When I'm analyzing, this is different from analyzing data. You don't have just have a topic in area, a topic in mind, and just want to analyze data. That's different. But even that, you should know what you're looking for, unless you're just good doing grounded theory, where you're just looking into the data to look for something of valuable to a topic. So that could also be in my topic is the number six. But if you are doing a PhD, when you're aiming at writing a paper, your analysis should engage these six dimensions, particularly the th- first three. Then in terms of profound contribution, number four. Okay, so I will not talk too much about this. I'll let us continue. Now, beyond the premise of the study, there is a checklist of resources that we need to have. The first thing is that, do I have my qualitative data ready? Available, accessible, and prepared. I'll come back to, I'll come to what I mean by available, accessible, and prepared. Do I have a research, a research questionnaire handy? Do I have access to a research questionnaire? It means that when you are doing the qualitative data analysis, you should have collected data or you should have been engaging with data, meaning, meaning a process of collecting. Because some people argue that whilst you're collecting data, you're analyzing at the same time. Because whilst people are giving you the data, you are choosing what to record and what not to call, call which is an analysis and analytical process. So people like Miles and Huberman, in their approach, argue that the first step, one of the first steps in analysis is the data collection step. As you're collecting the data, you're analyzing at the same time. So then the variables in relation to the research framework. The state of mind of the researcher. Somebody asked, Prof, why would you put state of mind on a researcher? Because sometimes when your mind is open to receive information and you're about to do the qualitative data analysis, it is easier for you to identify networks of relationships, links between variables. It's easier for you to be able to do the summarizing and the con- categorizing of the data. Now, the reason why it's important is that when your mind is quite heavy and you are so much on your mind, it's not good to do qualitative data analysis because you are looking into people's texts that they have shared with you, trying to think these are things. And if you're not, you are, if your mind is so much occupied and you don't have the freedom of being able to draw out links, from the what you are reading, what's going to happen is that you'll be blo- your, your mind itself will be blocked and some of the things that you are reading, you may overlook them and you may brush them over and that could affect the outcome of your analysis. So I would say the state of mind of the researcher is important. Then the philosophy of paradigm. Okay, so I'm a critical realist. I uh, will use reproduction. We try to find the constituent properties of a phenomenon. What makes it what it is and what is not what what does not make it what it is. We try to understand why it works in one particular way and why it's not working in another particular way. We try to unearth the mechanism that causes it. We try to unearth the structures that cause it. We try to unearth the liabilities that cause it. We try to unearth the powers and the end of the entities that cause it and the entities themselves. So when I go into a, 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 state, a statement, I am not going to school. What entity is saying that? What entities are embedded in the word, I am not going to school. There is the entity of the speaker. There is the entity of a destination, that's the school. Then I can then look at that, I am not going to school. What is the essence of what he said? He said, the, he is not going to school. So that part of he's not going to school, is it just a statement that he made in relation to one of my questions? So that I can then prove further why he's not going to school or is it a statement that is an outcome of um, um, a series of events that led to I am not going to school? 
So how did I am not going to school show up? What are the mechanisms that led to the where statement I am not going to school? What are the what are the liabilities of the power of, of, of the of, of the speaker? For example, does the entity who is speaking have the power to choose to go to school or not go to school? Because if the child say I'm not going to school, it's not as easy. It, it, it may not it may not be even believable as compared to a PhD student or an MPhil student or a graduate student or a, a master student say I'm not going to school. But if a two year old child is say I'm not going to school. You know the parent can just carry the child and take the child to school. The child doesn't have that power. He has got certain liabilities that does not allow her to be able to say that. But with the PhD student here, uh, he can do that. So for every entity in my data, I need to know the powers and liabilities of that particular entity. So that when I look at the data, I know that can he do or can he not do. But that's about critical realism and how we analyze data. I uh, will talk about that later. Maybe part three. Okay. So the research questionnaire and the respondents mapping. Okay. Now, I want to point out something because that's when you are looking at it. the questionnaire is is the operationalization of your research questions or objectives. The res respondents are the people who are going to give you answers about the experience that you seek to analyze to answer the research questions. Now, you need to do a mapping of respondents to the research questions. So I say, understand that these are the pivots of the of the activity. The link between the premise of the study and the qualitative analysis analysis process is the link between the 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 premise of the study and the qualitative data analysis process is how you map out the respondents and all the questionnaire. Which respondent is answering which questionnaire? You should understand that if you have a 30 point questionnaire it's, it's not all questionnaires that will be answered by a particular respondent especially if you are doing um, um you are doing triangulation and you are trying to collect data from multiple data sources you may realize that you may have a questionnaire for different different respondents so you have to know how you are mapping your variables and the questionnaire to fit each of the categories of respondents that you have i think we'll talk about respondent categorization later that's all about data collection it's in my case study, the case study uh, video series. So you can watch that one or later on, I'll, you can post it. And if you want me to do that, I'll, let me know and I'll, come to, I'll, I'll consider doing that. Okay. Okay, so questionnaire should address the research question through the lens of a research framework or the research of the, and the objectives of the study. So when we look at a research questionnaire, they have a relationship between the research questionnaire and the research framework. And that's a relationship between that framework and the a framework and the research question. So um, let's pause a little bit. I want to show you something. So if let's take Joseph's work. Joseph's objectives were for number one to explain the affordances and constraints of the digital music platforms in Ghana's musical industry. That's number one. To explain the force of value we talked about that the digital platforms are for the stakeholders. So remember, he's using the entities as stakeholders in the music industry. Number three. To explore the enabling, stimulating, and releasing conditions that affect. So, part of what we do in um, critical realism is to also understand conditions that cause certain things to occur. So, he's mentioned here enabling, stimulating, and releasing conditions. But all the dimensions he's mentioned to discuss it are drawn from the, the theory of affordances. So, so, he has enabling, stimulating, and releasing conditions coming from that. Then, that leads to certain questions. What constraints, what affordance and constraints do digital platforms provide? What forms of value do digital platforms afford at this? And then what are enabling, what enabling and stimulating and releasing conditions affect the value afforded by the digital platforms? So that brings us to an end. Now let's go into his research framework. So he did literature review, he discussed different types of value, the dimensions of, okay, so this is, um, the components of a technology affordance. So he says that the enabling conditions, an actor interacts with the technology, the enabling conditions, but all these things are embedded in the technical organizational context, which releases some stimulating, uh, certain stimulating conditions, and then uh, or, or factors, and then releasing factors that can inform the affordance. The affordance is about what the person can be able to do or not do because of the technology. 
and that will lead to a particular outcome. Okay. So an affordance is associated with the, um, an object or artifact or technology first, and and the actor second. Okay. We need to have both the act object and the goal oriented goal directed actor for an affordance to be perceived. An actor may be in an individual or a complex collection of individuals. As earlier stated, an affordance emerges when an actor relates to the technology. Therefore, imagine affordance. The third company is not so, solely associated with the features of the technology. Thus, an object affordance exists whether or not whether or not it is perceived or actualized. Okay, uh, an affordance may not be may never be actualized or even perceived, but someone who can actualize it must exist for the affordance to be meaningful, even though that person is unidentified. Therefore, affordance for an affordance to actualize, there should be someone who someone with the needed capability and the goal that will be served if the affordance is actualized. Okay. Okay. Similarly, adopting social media and enabled small medium and medium enterprises to sustain their relationship with customers. Simulating, stimulating conditions are typically organizational arrangements that make it easier to act. So then the constraining releasing conditions are often specific decisions that create that generate constraints. For instance, in managing digital platform, hesitation prevented an organization from releasing attractive data options and opportunities. Further, the lack of internet bandwidth from an internet service provider can be a constraining condition in perceiving and actualizing the technology affordance. Okay, that's very, very good. So he explains all these dimensions within his theory, the, the theory, they just, they justify why he's using the theory. Now you know that. Now, if you know these things, let me jump to his questionnaire at the end of the thesis. So let's see Joseph's questionnaire. So you see like Joseph's interview guide, he has um okay he has this one appendix the list of digital platforms these are the entities that he looked into digital platforms that he also said in he said it and then he went to to the digital platform questions who is the, the background information then you see the variables and so i said there's a relationship between your, your your variables in your framework and the variables in your research questionnaire so enabling stimulating and cohesive condition what motivates you to develop this platform. Then technology affordance and constraints. There should be something on value to value outcomes. Good. Then the process, how the thing works together. Data business, data platform business development manager. So then again, data music platform user. Okay. And entertainment. So these are different questions for different people. Okay. The musician using a data platform. So you see that. I told you that you should do respondents mapping. So that's what Joseph is doing here. He, uh, you have seen that Joseph is linking the respondents to different types of questions. Okay. So not all stakeholders or respondents are the same. If questionnaires are used, this should be identified and indexed as much as possible. So before we do the qualitative data analysis, because our analysis is tied to the data we have, we have to know which type of data came from which type of respondent. That's why we need to do a respondents mapping with the questionnaire and the data that we have. Number three, map out the respondents and know their relevance. Why are they in the study and what are they addressing? Why are you interviewing these different different dimensions of people? So that's the kind of question. I don't know whether Joseph addressed that in his um, methodology. So I'll go back to his methodology and see. So in his methodology, he talks about, okay, so he categorized that there is the typology of music platform. There's a creator type a platform distributor, not non-retailer, and then streamer, and then promoter, and then unregulated. So he, he was even able to categorize the different type of um, uh, platforms that existed. Then in collecting data from the platforms, okay, so he said he used, I used, um, uh, upon selection of the case platform, a purposive sampling technique was used to select respondents. Purposive sampling is a qualitative method for indicating and choosing suitable participants for research. So you have to define why you want them. Again, purposely sample, sampling targets persons and groups with proficiency and practice regarding the, the issue of interest. It considers availability and willingness of the participants and their communicative aptitude. So these are the things that he was looking out for. Okay. So he talks about the reliability. Okay, those ones, I think we can do that later. I just wanted to see, okay. So if you look at a questionnaire, he has got consumer, he has got um, you know, musicians there, he's got retailers there, he's got different types of people that he actually engaged with. Uh, let me see if I can find. Okay, good. So we can see them here. 
<coughs> okay, so look at this. A semi structured interview protocol was used to, for interviewing the digital music platform owner. The protocol included questions regarding the founding, design, and development, and implementation growth and impact of the platform. The platform owner was explicitly asked to either provide evidence or suggest interviews who can confirm his claims. Therefore, interviews with, interviews with other interviewees sought to collaborate or refine, verify or obtain in more depth insights into the platform owner's responses. Okay, so it then shows you that he collected data. This is something that students don't do. They don't show that this thing happened. And I'm telling, I'm, I've been telling that when you're doing your good qualitative data, um, qualitative research, in your methodology, show us what happened on the field. Show us a detailed data collection method that you had different people you interviewed. That shows how the data itself is being triangulated. It helps us to even map out. Because as you are looking to your data in your analysis, we want to identify the different subjects in the data analysis in their responses. So if you don't do this, you won't know. So you talk to each of them the time that you need to interview them. And there's also another issue. In qualitative data research, we, context is important. And then um, context itself too can be uh, uh, time time dependent too. Because when you collect data in the summer, even from when you collect data in the winter, even if it's from the same community, so if I study the same variables in winter, I may get very different answers when I look at the same variables in summertime. So it's always good to let us know the actual date in which the data was collected. Please underscore this particular statement. It's always good to let us know that the date in which the data was collected so that it can inform how we should analyze the data. If I'm going to study the production of apples and I show at the place at summertime and I don't find a springtime and I don't find apples but rather find uh, 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 flowers and I don't consider that it's springtime and I'll just go and say that there are no apples on the tree I have a flaw in my analysis I forgot to look at the time and the context in which I was doing the study so look at the different categories of subjects that you interview matters then goes your analysis process so we come back to that. So map out the respondents and know their relevance. Why are they there in the study? What are they addressing? Then we also, I also argue that make the data ready for analysis. Clean it up. What I mean clean it up is that it's not everything that the people said that you may have transcribed. Sometimes there's a lot of noise in the data that was collected, a lot of interjections. So when you are, when you are transcribing the data, you have to clean those things up as much as possible, not interfering the context of the state of the, of the of the responses and how the tone of the responses. But you want to try and make sure that what is chaff and is not needed shouldn't be captured within the transcription. Then you should also look at data from different sources. For example, Joseph said that whilst the person was being interviewed, he also asked the person to recommend others who can, who can appropriately give feedback on the answers that he, the platform owner, had provided. There should be time index. You saw my own user showing the time that the, 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 the stakeholder it was interviewed. There should be stakeholder index, who was interviewed. Then it can also be variable index. That's a very interesting thing. Because when you're looking at a variable like uh, Joseph mentioned, one of the variables was value. And maybe one of the, value, the values that Joseph was looking at was financial value. If I take financial value, I may see financial value from the platform owner perspective, from the platform developer's perspective, from the musician perspective. So you can have different forms of value as being tagged by different types of response respondents. So if your objective is to stay with the respondents, then you have to index the respondents and then index the type of variable that you are you are trying to examine from the particular data that you have. In looking at your data and preparing it, one of the first questions you ask yourself is the data available? The data that is the data available exhausted has the questionnaire been adequately admitted and all the questions duly answered by different respondents sometimes some of the information you may you may be still be it will be pending certain other data that will be coming from other other units so you may have collected some of the data you don't have everything so and it's always good to check in terms of preparing yourself for analysis check the data that i have is it just one person's perspective or i have 
other people's perspective on the issue so that I can actually know that it's coming from an objective place and I can also get opportunity of engaging with the data to be able to know that it is clean, it is exhaustive, and it covers almost everything I want to analyze it for. Use it for use it, what all the other variables I would like to use it for the analysis process. Has all the variables and questions and some questions in the study been explored consistent with the, the framework? Okay. This is quite can I index the data that's labeled and categorize them by time, respondents, and variables and questions, which is important. You have a lot of data that you have collected. Can you be able to categorize and label them and place what goes where? Which one is linking to this particular issue? Okay, what is missing? Part of, I remember when I was doing my PhD, my supervisor told me that when you collect data every day, pause and, re and reflect on the data and ask yourself, what do I have and what is missing? If you don't ask that question, you may end up finish, uh, finishing your data collection, pack your things and go back to maybe if you're doing your PhD in the US, go back to the US, only for you to realize that there's a whole section that is missing because you didn't you didn't engage with your own data. You didn't know whether there was something missing or not. So please take your time and check. Now, what is missing? What do I need to triangulate? I have only one perspective and I need to go back to collect more data. This sometimes happens. That sometimes, you may realize that for a particular issue, you only have got one perspective. You cannot use that one to carry out genuine analysis. So you want to get other people's views to shape your the outcome of your your analysis. So you are then asking yourself that this data I have, can I triangulate? Can I get other people to give their perspectives on it so that I can be able to draw out new and fresh themes from a collective? In, in what form do I have my data? Okay. Now, qualitative data analysis techniques for mouse and human mind talks about data collection, data condensation, data display, and then verifying and concluding data. Now, what he talks about data display is that with qualitative data, as you have collected it, don't just bury it. Try to make sure that you display the data. Either you summarize this into tables, so you can compare with each other, or you also try to visualize certain draw diagrams to be able to talk about processes that exist and, and then make linkages with their processes. So you can use models, you can actually use models, you can also use tables, you can use so many types of information to create a visualization of your data. Those are people can enhance understanding of people. Ensure validity, that's construct internal, external, um, Reliability. So there are different forms of validity that you are supposed to achieve. And I thought this in case study, the constant validity, whether the construct is measuring what you're supposed to measure, the internal validity, whether there's consistency and logic, logic, logic flow of events to be able to precipitate a particular outcome or statement. Okay. And then um, external validity, the extent to which the research finds, as I mentioned earlier, I don't forget are transferable and can fit the other fit other contexts. To enhance transferability, this study used a predefined selection criteria to obtain the theoretical sample from a list of variable, a list of available digital music platforms. Even though this list contains digital music platforms in Gaia, the typology can be used to categorize platforms from other countries. See what Jason is talking about. Those categorizations I was looking at of the different different types of uh, um, data platform owners is even the contribution. That's what he's actually telling. He, he has been able to categorize them when the categorization was not existing earlier. Now, the researcher should also be careful about something. How much time do you have? <laughs> Remember, I mentioned that one of the, on the premise of this, um, on the premise of the study, I was talking. I was talking about that if you are going to do a qualitative data analysis, one of the key things that you should try to look through in the premise is to look at your research problem objectives and all those dimensions. Another point that I'm that is important with the checklist is to try to make sure that we can be able to understand the time that we have in carrying out any qualitative data analysis. So that if you have more time, you can take your time to engage with the data. But if you have less time, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. What paradigm does you does the researcher belong to? And does he understand 
is research in relation to their paradigm that's also a very good question now what happens is that sometimes a student is an interpretivist or constructivist but he doesn't he has just used as a label he doesn't even understand what we require of him or her when he looks into data being able to understand the paradigm that you belong to and the tenets of the paradigm and how they view analysis and the kind of discussions that um the the kind of um analytical techniques that are maybe required do you know them you have to know them within the paradigm that you belong to what type of, of data do i have and what data analysis techniques are needed for my study so that's also a good point so there are different different techniques and you may have to know which one you are going to use so lastly we have pointed out what is required and what we should be careful about so now let's go into the next part now so somebody is asking a prof so where is the steps the steps is what i'm discussing establish your premise of study go to your your checklist of resources look at the choice of data techniques that you have and then select which of them you are going to use now this list i have here is not an exhaustive list but it's a starting point to help you understand there are different different techniques i mentioned earlier the techniques come together to form what we may call an approach so at every qualitative research activity you the analyst person carrying out the analysis the researcher should know that there are different techniques and they work at different levels this is something that students don't know they just think that all the techniques are the same and the other techniques can be used anyhow no there are different steps that you are going through in your analysis process. So the first thing is, at the first level, you have got fundamental or foundational techniques. Loose ones helps us to carry to engage with data to make sense of it in terms of categories and summarizing. I am going to school. Who said it? And why did he say it? The who said it is a student who said it. And then why he and what he see saying? He's talking about a choice of his behavior or his his reaction towards schooling categorizing categorizing is a technique that we use at the first level and the mouse of human talks about that so the references there are some of the authors that you can find them who mention who discuss these things now sometimes because the data is plenty you have to sample responses so you have to choose from different respondents to use their work sampling of responses is also discussed by mouse of human then you have the coding process so i have got the data in front of me plenty of them and i have done my transcription but because the data is voluminous i'm going to do sample of resource and um, responses i can be purposive like joseph was purposive in selecting who he should look at so i'll talk to this person and this person and this person you can collect it can be purposive in the data connection the collection and um, your data analysis um, um, list of respondents. So which other respondents are we more interested in? Maybe those who are worked with Uber for more than three years, if you are looking at data platform services and what the and what the data platform owners see. Okay. Then in that case you may end up having to have a categorization who then becomes part of the study. Okay, then you have coding. There are different types of constructs and common talks about open coding, axial coding, and selective coding. All of these are different types of coding and they are, um, they are in a hierarchy. So as you do open coding, you move on to axial coding, you move on to selective coding. Then you have got data display, which is also a technique coming from mouse and human man. So as a human man, at the foundation level, they suggest a number of different types of techniques. The next level is that now that you have been able to do the foundational things of labeling and then selecting certain uh, type of data that uh, certain uh, collecting your data and then categorizing your data and presenting it in maybe in the form of a, a case study now you have to now engage that data with the analysis so you go through your first one of the foundational techniques apply them then you go to a second level apply it to the data that you have collected and the second level, you are then going to do something we call memory. When you look for uh, a point in the literature that has resonates some of the things that you know already or some of the things that you are yet to know, either coming from the literature review or other future studies. 
So memoing is can be confirmatory or con- contradictory. Sometimes, sometimes you may find something that con- contradicts what you are doing right now, or can confirm. Then there's thematic analysis where we are look for themes. So the thematic analysis has been described by several authors, and there are different, different Brown and Clark and which are some of the popular authors whose work also um, um, on qualitative data analysis from a thematic perspective has changed the phase of thematic analysis. Okay, and then we have got pattern matching, which is a technique that comes from um, Yin in his book in 1994. He talked about cross case study, he talked about Yin pattern matching. Pattern matching, we'll be looking for different parts because case analysis, you put the cases together. But what happens is that as you are doing all these things in the primary, you are employing some of the foundation techniques to be able to shape the primary technique that you are looking into. And then there's discourse analysis, there's conversation, conversation analysis, content analysis, and narrative analysis. All these are types of qualitative data analysis that we can approve um, and with techniques that we can use. Then I need to also point out that some of the research approaches for data analysis are usually a combination of the primary and then the fundamental. In fact, almost all of them. Okay. So, Miles and Huberman, and some of them are the researcher driven. So, the person, the researcher himself, may have developed a name for it. For Miles and Huberman data analysis techniques, brings a, a set of different techniques together and tells you how to use, use analyze qualitative data. Then you have got Denmark et al 2202 which is an exploratory research model that tells you what what are the different steps in analysis of qualitative data usually from a Denmark is a critical release or a critical release perspective then a Eastern's guide for case study it's a very good paper so which tells you as uh, um, how to be able to do do case study from a critical release perspective there's also another one by for Walsham. So you have got Eastern's guys of guide for case study. Then the interpretive case study by Klein and Miles, Walsham, their whole body of work there. Then then grounded theory, which I mentioned earlier, is about looking at the data and trying to draw out theories from it. Then you have got gen, change data analysis steps, which quite a number of the people students use now because it's it's like mouse and human man combines a number of the different steps together. Okay, so now let's look into detail. When I look, at, when I collect data, the first thing I should ask myself is that, what is my data saying? And to be able to do that, to be able to look at do my, to do that, I will draw on my foundational techniques. I will start looking at the data I have and do open coding, but with an, with the lens of addressing my research questions and addressing the purpose of the study. Then when I look at what the data says, I can ask myself that what teams can I draw from what the data is saying? I'll combine my foundational skills with my other primary techniques, that's including axial coding, data display, thematic and cross case analysis. So that will draw, that will link me to my second order of constructs. So the first order is to look into my the code, the coding and draw out the codes. Then I can go to the second level where I draw out the themes to define the constructs at that stage. Then I go to the final one, one which I'm trying to link the link what I found earlier with theory and how it informs theory. So in here, I have all the dimensions and I've got the primary techniques, the foundational techniques, and the selective the selective coding, cross case analysis and pattern matching, all of them being discussed at that final level. Now, any student carrying out research should know where he is and do know which of the methods is he going to apply. Some of you in your PhD in year two, you are still somewhere here, early part of this part. Then we go to aggregate theoretical level where we start bringing them together to generate meaningful sentences and that contributes something. So that will take us to how then we can link them to theory too. So the aggregate theoretical level, we are going to link what we have found with the theory to make very good sense of it. Okay. Now these are steps 
that if I follow them very well, it will culminate into very good conclusions or some suggestive findings. So now let's see this as an example. Before I look at this, I want us to read something from Joseph's work. Joseph says something here. Okay, we are in part one. We'll be rounding up soon. I wanted to just take an hour. We are going a little bit up above an hour, so I will just round up soon. So look at Joseph's analysis process. So he tells us for question one. This studies data analysis aimed to answer the research question. The research question one aimed at explaining affordances and constraints that the music industry, the music, music, the digital music platform provides to the Ghanaian music industry. The resulting affordances and constraints were further categorized to each of the, the different actors in the industry. Remember what I mentioned earlier? Linking, if you don't remember, let me show you. I don't want to say that I'm just saying that one of the steps that we are going to achieve is to know how to label, you can, can you label or categorize them, the data by time, respondents, variables, and research questions. That's one thing that in terms of making data available, accessible, and prepared, that's something that you are required to do. So if you look at it, Joseph here is confirming our statement that he did, one thing that he did was that he looked at the affordances and constraints. That is what he wants to achieve outcome and then he categorized and linked them to the different actors there was a musician there was there was a producer there are people from the industry he linked them to it so that you can be able to say that okay these are the viewpoints that you are cont contributing and it goes on to say that this step was undertaken because finances are context specific and dependent on specific goal-oriented actors identified from the cases He had to be specific. He by linking them together and then also appreciating that the goals oriented actors could change. Okay. Some of the affordances identified include localized targeting, conditional awareness for the platform developer, and revenue generation and storage for the musicians. Give an example. The study followed established procedures as illustrated in figure 1.4.1 analyze the qualitative data resulting from the interviews. The first step involved open coding, consisting of breaking and naming interview data into discrete conditions. So you now know what we do at the open coding stage. Open coding stage, sorry. Open coding stage, we are now break, looking at what the data is saying. So we are going to do what? We are going to break down and naming the interview data into discrete conditions. The main output of this first order course is the first order course, which offer descriptive labels for a variety of interview responses about why they interacted with the digital case platform, music platform. Some conditions, some of the conditions identify the interview responses include exclusive music release and risk and subscription fees. The second step involved axial coding. So axial coding is the second step. Remember axial coding here. What is axial coding? An inductive and recursive and process through which familiar, some similar first order codes are combined into a more abstract second order code. For instance, exclusive album release, customer referrals were collectively labeled as exclusiveness. The third step, step was selective coding. That's the last one. How does it inform literature? How does it inform theory? Selective coding, which involved combining second or similar second order constraints into obtain more aggregate theoretical dimensions. Okay, so that takes us to the last part. And then he that's where he said that he's um, able to come out with some theoretical dimension. So the dimension that has come there can be informed by theory. But all of these things are different forms of labeling. Just that we have got a different one, one which is called the open coding. We started from the open code and then went to the axial coding and then we went lastly to the selective code okay so this is it this is an example at the first order level joseph found current audience market platform market uh, platform target market market expansion then he also has direct in revenue potential allied activities and um, lack of value. All these things come together to inform the market orientation and platform revenue. Okay, so you have the second order ones. 
coming together to define what we call the platform potential. I believe we're now saying that when you put these things together, it will culminate into certain conclusions or suggestive findings, or perhaps draw lessons that can inform a framework. So now let's go into the actual data. I want to show you actual data. Um, so this is what Joseph was pointing out as the step that he carried out. So if you look at it, it's just similar to what we see here. Open coding at the empirical data level. This was informed by the, the research framework that he had. Then after that, he went to axial coding, the second other outputs. Then from there, he went into selective coding, the actual statements he can make based on. So let's go back and then look at the data itself. Sorry that I had to. All these are data display. This in the in the box here. This is where how the coding takes place. Somebody was asking how the coding took place. So in the box here, in the middle part, you have got the words or the quotations from the date from the field. And we said label all quotations, index them with the person who said it. Remember, I mentioned that. So, but the, we are studying we are at the development of um, certain enabling and stimulating conditions and releasing conditions. So when we interview the person, the person said, but the ignorance of musicians relying on shows is a problem. Musicians think they can only make money when they play shows or adverts. That's what a, a music platform, a, a digital music platform developer is talking about. But when you ask the musician the same thing, you see, Joseph is putting in here to show you triangulation happening in it. We rely on shows because we, what that's what we know. I can see cash physically after performing. <laughs> so what do we see here? We are seeing a number of codes. In terms of the first order codes, what is the person saying? The first person statement is more about the mindset of the Ghanaian musician. The second statement shows that we, that's, now we are talking to the musician himself. Is demonstrating ignorance. So when we take the two together, we are getting themes that are mindset and ignorance that are all at this level, the open coding level or specific indicators. Then when I bring them together, I bring the mindset to the ignorance. It can then tell me that this is the culture that is prevailing within the environment. So now can you see how it is working? We started from mindset, we want ignorance. Mindset came from the digital music developer. Ignorance came from the musician. This is one of the reasons why it was, I was emphasizing that index your different responses. Do a mapping with the stakeholders. And I was also saying that do index the answers according to respondent and according to the value, the, the, outcome of the study so that when you are looking at a question like describe the enabling and the stimulating and releasing conditions that you face in the industry you can put the data music developers viewpoint and then bring in the people and the musician now this is an open way of demonstrating that there's you are checking or checking using uh, triangulation to check whether there's consistency in what is being said and shared with you. Then it can lead out to an outcome factor. Okay. Let's look at another one. So, apart from mindset, there was another one here. It said that on readiness. So, then this is another open a, a variable coming from the open coding. It said we introduced here to a musician and, and a data platform developer. We introduced Diggy Muse, which was very difficult to start up because we had to convince. So you see, my management has not spoken, has not spoken about selling my music online. Maybe we are not ready. So unreadiness is here. And then the first one was about the unreadiness at the startup of the platform. The next one is about skepticism. So now the idea about prevailing culture is becoming stronger. Because you see, all these are coming from what people are saying. At the same time, they were skeptical. The, at the same time, we were skeptical. These are the same musician who will run to iTunes and Spotify, but we won't won't run to the local versions doing doing specifically the same thing where people can buy 
buy with a credit card or more money. Okay, I prefer iTunes and, and Co because my predecessors use it. It is widely known as compared to the local platform. I don't know if the local ones can work like iTunes and Spotify. And the labels that you do at that level will be your first order con constructs and later we'll move on to your second order constructs. Okay. So I've shown you what's happening here. So now, to be able to let you understand it very well, well, qualitative data has indicators. The indicators are embedded in the people's speeches and the responses they give you to you. So when you read their responses, draw out the first order constructs from their in, from their speeches and from their responses. Then from there, you can then put the two or three or four more different first order constructs together to generate a second order concept. So if you look at it, the indicators were telling us, let's go back to Joseph's work, that there are issues. Some of the issues that Joseph told us from the, as he used as indicator was skepticism coming from both the developer and the, and the musician. Then then unreadiness coming from both the developer and the musician. Then you mentioned another one too, the mindset of the person coming from the musician and the, the, the platform owner and the ignorance coming from the musician. So when you put them together in the illustrative quotations, you will see the indicators there that generated our variables. And from our variables, we went on to do a second order constructs. Okay. Then from there, we can go to do a third order construct depending on the evaluation of the second order construct. So do your open coding output. Go to your actual axial coding and go to selective coding and update the framework. That's my advice. So this is where it will end up. We we'll start with the empirical, we look at the pre study pre-study framework, and then we'll end up with the post-study framework, depending on the type of study that we are doing. I believe that now you have the different standards at the open coding level i can apply a number of different techniques when i go to azure coding apply different techniques and go to selective coding output and let's see apply different techniques and then lead, lead towards my research framework which will be revised based on the outcome of my selective coding output. now mouse and huberman talks about data condensation putting your data together Data display, display it in tables and visualization. Do you see? And then you also talked about verify conclusions. When you're verifying conclusions, you are going to then propose that what can we learn from what we have done in the analysis. Now, there's a difference between analysis and discussion. Analysis will tell us what is inside. Discussion will compare what you have found with the existing literature. That's why we call it data analysis. The data, data analysis and discussion. Data analysis and discussion. Now, I've taken some questions. I've answered them whilst I was presenting. So I'll pause here as in the part one. Going over everything with you. This is what we expect you to do. First of all, establish the premise of the study secondly go to your checklist of for qualitative research to be able to know whether you are ready for data analysis you find the not just the resources that you want you also want to ask yourself certain questions in terms of the data whether it's available and it's exhaustive whether all the variables in your study have been captured in it that's very very important and whether you can index your data Okay, then what should the researcher be careful about? Okay. Then I will go to the choice of techniques. So another four point. The choice of techniques is that there are different types of techniques. You have to know what you are going to use them for. There is the fundamental ones and the primary ones. We have a level of techniques. We have to make a choice, but depending on what we want to do. So at the fundamental one, it can help us be able to do define our first order constructs. And the second one, our second level constructs then when we put them together we can then finalize the work and then finalize the work okay so i mentioned that to be able to do this you have to know the relationship that start from the first order go to the second order and go to the 
aggregate church car order. That's the third order. Tend to be related together. So as you build it here, you build that, you build that, you build that. Now, if you do it very well, you can come up with certain conclusions or revise your, your study framework. And just as sure as an example, our indicators are going to look into the data. Then to help us be able to inform, we, we will then do sampling. So if you look at it, Joseph is doing sampling here, choosing which of them will be here. Sample of responses, I mentioned that. So the sample of responses are there and different responses to aggregate the data. But he has categorized them and labeled them under specific research questions. So he's using the research questions, if you look at it carefully, using the research questions to categorize the description of, of enabling and release, simulating releasing conditions. So if you want answers to this, you look at this table. So the table itself has sample responses in them. And the first order and the second order will come. So this is what I intended to show. So by now, as of now, I expect that everybody who has listened to me can now appreciate that there are different levels of quantitative data analysis. There are different things that you should be expecting, expected to use or why you're using them and different forms of data. I'm hoping that when we get to the part two, I can take the different levels, like the fundamental and the primary, and explain each of them. What does it mean that you have primary techniques like memory, thematic analysis? What is even thematic analysis? I'll do these things the next time that I'm doing a presentation to you. I'll look into those ones and answer. Until then, if you have any question, you can let me know. Now I'll address it meaningfully. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have unstable internet, so there have been a lot of breaks, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>